Good morning, everyone. Uh, I warmly welcome all the participants to all of the resource person as well as uh, physical and virtual parties uh, attendees for month of June Young Physician Forum and the Ceylon uh, the College Lecture of the Ceylon College of Physicians. Uh, so we'll start first with the Young Physicians Forum presentation. The, our first speaker today is Dr. DMJMH Ammagamana, Senior Registrar in Medicine, Teaching Hospital, Andhra He'll be speaking to us on South Asian oocytosis in association with renal tubule acidosis. Over to you, Dr. Ammagamana. Good morning. Thank you, sir, for the introduction. Thank you, CCP, to giving this opportunity to me. And today, my topic is Southeast Asian oocytosis and association with renal tubular acidosis. Next 20 25 minutes, I will be discussing about clinical presentations in renal tubular acidosis and how do we diagnose distal renal tubular acidosis and what are the common causes for distal renal tubular acidosis. And at the end, I will discuss about Southeast Asian oocytosis. There are two clinical scenarios that I have, I will be encountered in next 20 minutes. The case number one, that is 45 year old man present with difficulty in walking for a year. He had a pre, two previous hospital admissions due to generalized body weakness, but there's no symptoms of anemia or osmotic symptoms. He is having weakness on hip flexion and extension, but his tone reflexes and sensory modalities were normal. We will have a look. What is his gait? He is having short stature and he is having waddling gait. We will have a look how he is getting up from the squatting position. That he is having difficulty in getting up from the squatting position. Okay, we will have a look how we have investigated this patient. His full blood count, completely normal. And the parameters including MCV and MCH and MCHC also normal in this patient and his random blood sugar values were normal. And uh, his serum creatinine value is normal, within normal range. I have highlighted the abnormal investigations that he had, that is potassium 2.4. He had hypocalcemia, uh, hypokalemia. And he is having hypocalcemia with normal phosphate level. And he is having increased alkaline phosphatase value with uh, 25 hydroxy vitamin D level in insufficient range. And he's, he had venous bicarbonate of 16 with blood pH value of 7.32. And his urine pH was 7. And he had increased urinary potassium extraction, which was elicited from the spot urinary potassium excretion was 40 millimoles per liter. And he is having urine calcium creatinine ratio 553 that is significantly high compared to normal. Apart from his other investigations, his abdominal x-ray, we can see bilateral nephrocalcinosis in this x-ray. And previously, he was managed as hypokalemic periodic paralysis and he was on oral KCL tablets. Apart from these findings of bilateral nephropalcinosis, he is having radiological evidence suggestive of bilateral neck of the femur fractures. Those are pathological fractures that has seen by consultant orthopedic surgeon as well. And at the end, I will be discussed how we have managed this patient. The second clinical case, that is 37-year-old lady present with acute onset weakness of the body and she couldn't get up from the bed in the morning. There is no history of trauma or headache 
and on examination she was apebrile and her conscious level was normal and her hydration is adequate and her pulse rate was 70 beats per minute and his uh, her blood pressure was 100 by 60 she had increased respiratory rate on admission that is 24 cycles per minute with normal pulse oximetry saturation was 98% on room air and she had normal breath sound in bilateral lung fields she had significant bilateral lower limb and upper limb weakness with normal reflexes and normal sensory. In the emergency department, we have done the venous blood gas and the ECG, and her ECG findings are compatible with hypokalemia. She had long QT interval and uh, presence of U-wave, and uh, because of low potassium value in the venous blood gas, we have done uh, Mm, urgent serum potassium value that is source um, 1.6 millimoles per liter and she had blood pH of 7.31 with serum bicarbonate 30 millimoles per liter and she had no uh, in marginal increased chloride values with normal anion gap and her urine pH on day 2 and day 3 was 7 and she also had increased urinary potassium excretion that is 30 millimoles per liter. And her urine calcium creatinine ratio also increased, but she had normal magnesium and calcium levels. After six hours of hospital admission, even after correction of potassium with intravenous casual infusion, she had type two respiratory failure and we have electively intubated this patient and she was on mechanical ventilation for 48 hours. And she was discharged on, from the ward on fifth day of hospital admission. Next, we will have a look how we are evaluating this kind of hypokalemic patients in the, our ward setting and clinical setting. Hypokalemia can be due to uh, redistribution as well as uh, pseudo hypokalemia. But these patients are having increased urinary potassium excretion as I, uh, suggested by uh, more than 20 millimoles per liter uh, spot urinary potassium excretion. And these two patients had normal blood pressure. And in the uh, blood pH and their bicarbonate level was low, therefore they are having metabolic acidosis. The in ex uh, investigation findings are consistent with renal tubular acidosis. If these patients had alkalosis, the causes are Barter syndrome and Gittelman syndrome and uh, thyroid like diuretic use. You all know this kind of things. Um, and this hypokalemia evaluation, as we all know, hypertension with metabolic alkalosis. Uh, those, there are several co causes in the other side that is renin secreting tumors and con syndrome. And what is renal tubular acidosis? That is, the capacity for normal urinary acidification is in impaired, resulting in net acid retention and hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. Renal tubular acidosis is broadly categorized into two, that is hypokalemic renal tubular acidosis and hyperkalemic renal tubular acidosis. Hypokalemic renal tubular acidosis, there are two types, that is one, number one is type one renal tubular acidosis, also called distal renal tubular acidosis, and type two, also called proximal renal tubular acidosis. The primary defect in the type one renal tubular acidosis is impaired acid secretion from the distal tubule or collecting ducts. And usually their serum bicarbonate level is low. Sometimes it may be low, less than 10 millimoles per liter as well. And the urinary pH always more than 7.3. And their plasma uh, potassium level values were, uh, were low all the time. And the uh, urinary anion gap is usually increased or urinary or smaller gap is low less than 150. This urinary anion gap and urine or small gap consistent with low urine ammonia mix concentration. And in time for renal tubular acidosis, usually they are having increased urine calcium creatinine ratio. And uh, because of citrate, uh, hypocitrate urea and uh, hypercalciuria, they will get nephrolithiasis or nephrocalcinosis. What is type two? or proximal renal tubular acidosis, that is reduced proximal bicarbonate reabsorption. 
and their bicarbonate level also usually marginally low. Sometimes it may be normal as well. And uh, their potassium level value may be normal low, low. And but their urine calcium creatinine ratio was normal. There is no nephrocalcinosis or so nephrolithiasis in this kind of patients. Hyperkalemic renal tubular acidosis broadly too. That is type four, as we all know, hypoaldosteronism. And another entity is there are distilled tubular sodium transport defects that is due to reduced sodium reabsorption unrelated to aldosterone. Aldosterone in type four renal tubular acidosis that is decreased. Aldosterone secretion or aldosterone resistant. Both of these conditions having high potassium, serum potassium value. I will be concentrated on distal renal tubular acidosis. How do we diagnose distal renal tubular acidosis? The gold standard test for diagnosis of distal renal tubular acidosis is ammonium chloride load test, which can be used. You, it's controversial. In uh, typical cases, most of the time, we, we don't need that to have an ammonium chloride load test because presence of hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis and inappropriately high urine pH value with single measurement of urine anion gap, which is positive, is sufficient to diagnose distal renal tubular acidosis as ammonium chloride uh, can cause nausea, vomiting, and cardiac arrhythmias as well. What are the causes for distal renal tubular acidosis? There are primary causes for distal renal tubular acidosis that can be idiopathic, that means sporadic cases, and familial primary distal renal tubular acidosis. There are mainly two inheritance patterns, that is autosomal dominant inheritance pattern and autosomal recessive pattern. There are several secondary causes for distal renal tubular acidosis, mainly autoimmune disorders like Sjogren's syndrome, autoimmune hepatitis, primary biliary cholangitis, SLE, and rheumatoid arthritis. Drugs like amphotericin B, lithium carbonate, ibuprofen, trimethoprim can cause distal renal tubular acidosis. And hypercalcemic, hypercalciuric conditions like hyperparathyroidism, vitamin D intoxication, sarcoidosis, and idiopathic hypercalciuric conditions can cause distal renal tubular acidosis. Other than that, there are uh, medullary sponge kidney disease, obstructive uropathy, kidney transplant rejections, and Wilson disease also causes, causes for distal renal tubular acidosis. We'll have a look on the complications of this distal renal tubular acidosis. Usually they are in a hypokalemia with uh, sometimes we have seen two, three cases of hypokalemia with respiratory paralysis in our city. And uh, nephrocalcinosis or nephrolithiasis, as I have told that they have in hypercalciuria and uh, low citrate in the urine. Therefore, they will get uh, nephrocalcinosis or nephrolithiasis. And there is a metabolic bone disease secondary to osteomalacia, uh, and they can cause pathological fractures. Then we'll have a look on. What is this Southeast Asian holocytosis? It's an inherited red cell membrane disorder commonly seen in Papua New Guinea, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Thailand. And presence of oligocytosis, kinocytes, and histomocytes in the peripheral blood pit smear is sufficient to diagnose Southeast Asian holocytosis. But the I, uh, Gold standard test for diagnosis of Southeast Asian oligocytosis is detection of genetic mutation from the gene assay. And this Southeast Asian oligocytosis confers protection against severe plasmodium falciparum malaria, resembling sickle cell disease, G6PD deficiency, and thalassemia. That is mainly alpha thalassemia. And these are the Southeast Asian countries like Philippines, Malaysia and uh, Thailand and Indonesia and the Papua New Guinea, mainly coastal regions, this disease is uh, prevalent. What is this genetic abnormality? We'll have a look. Uh, red blood cell anion exchange one or brand three transports in distal renal tubular acidosis patients. Well, the anion exchange type one is an integral membrane protein 
that exchange intracellular bicarbonate for extracellular chloride. It is encoded by SLC4A1 gene, that is the gene that you don't need to remember, the, that produces two isoforms. Those isoforms are located in RB red blood cell, also known as band 3, and it's responsible for uh, is cytoskeleton in the red blood cell and alpha intercalated cells of the renal collecting duct. Commonly, there are three gene mutations and presence of compound heterozygosity in these mutations will cause South Asian Southeast Asian oocytosis and associated distal renal tubulacidosis. Actually, this is a primary cause for distal renal tubulacidosis, as I have mentioned initially. And there are several studies in the well-recognized journals, and there are several case reports in the Sri Lanka at the moment. How we have treated this patient? That is, treatment is we have to correct the potassium value, and we have to correct the acidosis from the replacement of alkaline medium, and uh, we have to supply citrate as they are having low citrate, hypocitrate urea, and uh, they are welcome. Uh, uh, potassium citrate tablets are there, and we get as in the first patient we had uh, hypocalcemia. Uh, we have replaced the hypocalcemia uh, uh, calcium sup with su calcium supplements and vitamin D. What is the take-home message from this discussion today? That is, though South Asian oocytosis is commonly described in Southeast Asian countries. There are several reported cases of South Asian oocytosis in Sri Lanka. Therefore, it is important to screen distal renal tubular acidosis patients for coexistence of South Asian oocytosis, even with normal full blood count parameters. The first reported case was from the NHSL, that is a case of distal renal tubular acidosis and Southeast Asian oocytosis and possible fluorosis. And the, the other several case reports, case series also there. My acknowledgement towards my supervisors in professorial medical unit, teaching hospital and Rajapura, and uh, patients of, and my, our staff. Thank you. The time for the question. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. uh, on a, something probably not that common in this country, but something important to be looked into. Uh, it's open for questions. Uh, the management said this, uh, there are three methods of male inheritance, autosomal dominant pattern uh, inheritance, uh, there are, but in Sri Lanka we are not doing the gene analysis. In other countries, the study shows that uh, autosomal dominant inheritance patterns as well as residue. Uh, if this is autosomal, the electrolyte disturbances occurs in the teenage years. But this 45-year-old gentleman was also presented at the age of 45, and he had a significant pathology factors because of late diagnosis. If uh, they are family history, uh, family people are doing a black picture, just we can diagnose these conditions. And uh, at the age of around 20, we can screen this for electrolyte abnormalities, and we can diagnose and we can treat from that time onwards. That's the most beneficial thing in this. So the first patient is having backache and then he is a farmer. He was able to carry out his activities usually for about last one week, year he had deterioration of his uh, activity that's why he has presented to our casual teacher. and uh, we have evaluated and uh, after treatment he is he can do his day-to-day -day activities as well and the second case is totally acute presentation of hypokalemia. Uh,
any more questions from the audience? Equality between people and Yes, sir. Vitamin B12 level, we haven't checked, sir. The black picture features suggest to vitamin B12 or uh, joint patients and examination findings and other things were not suggest to vitamin B12. Why do you get this? Uh, vitamin D levels in these patients? This is, sir, he, this is vitamin D. Uh, he had insufficient vitamin D levels, sir. No, but is it also here with uh, RT? Uh, no, usually not, sir. No. They have been hypocalcemia. See, actually, he had a secondary hypo, hyperparathyroidism, secondary hypocalcemia. This uh, vitamin D deficiency, it's very difficult to explain in this patient. Sir, that's why we have replaced the vitamin D. That's maybe due to that our population vitamin D level is in range usually. When we are screened, that may be the reason. Okay. Any more questions? In absence of any more questions, thank you very much, Dr. Mangamai. Uh, there's a certificate of appreciation for your presentation. Please accept that. Thank you, sir.